please uh, rise for the reading of the scripture. Today we're reading from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 11 and 16 through 21. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise, Praise be, be to God. God. Please be seated. Thank you, Scott, for reading the scripture for us this morning. Let's bow together one more time quickly for a word of prayer. Father, we just bathe this time in your prayer, in prayer to you, Lord, and ask you to make your presence felt and known among us as we read uh, your word and uh, let your word speak to our hearts. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to engage with what you want to share with us today. You have a message for every single person here this morning. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. You are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Scott, may I ask you real quickly, would you go shut the office door there in case, in case the phone rings or something like that? I don't want a distraction. appreciate that. Well, we've been, uh, I took a survey and you all gave me suggestions, questions, things you'd like to hear about. So last week we did loving God passionately, loving Him self-sacrificially. That's what the person asked for. But they also asked, how do we do that for people? How do we love people that way? So that was the suggestion for the sermon today, uh, loving others like Jesus did. When Charles Schwab, you know who Charles Schwab is, many of you if you do investments, when he was 70 years old, he made the following statement. And these words were spoken for the record in a court of law after he just won a nuisance lawsuit. He said, I'd like to say here in a court of law and speaking as an old man that 90% of my troubles are traceable to my being kind to others. Wow. Kind of goes against the grain of the gospel message don't you think? But those of us who've lived any amount of time on this earth understand what he's saying. We understand those feelings. The fact of the matter is it's far easier in life to be a loner. It's far easier to only deal with ourselves than it is to mix it up with a bunch of other people. Because when you start mixing it up with other people, when you get involved in other people's lives, Trouble is right around the corner. Life becomes much more difficult. Life gets painful and messy. And yet, if, if we only stay to ourselves, we miss out on making a difference in other people's lives. We miss out on personal growth. We miss out on experiencing love in our life. 
So like I said, last week, well, we're, we're going to pull in the, the, the sermon scripture from last week a little bit in this sermon as well. Last week we looked at the greatest commandment. The thing Jesus said was most important. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. But Jesus didn't stop there, did He? He said the second commandment is this. Uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. And a, a translation says, when he, Jesus said that, He states that that commandment is equally important to the first commandment. So the jest is that you really can't separate the two. He does put one first and one second, but the second commandment, as you know, as I said, is love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says those are connected. You can't separate them. You can't make them... They're not really two different commandments in a sense. In fact, as we read in the call to worship this morning from the book of Galatians, Paul said the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. So if the first commandment about loving God and the second commandment about loving others are inseparable, if they go together, then one really important connection that Jesus makes for us here is this. We love others best when we love God the most. We were designed to be social beings. That's the way God created us. To desire a vertical connection with God and a horizontal community and connection with others. But we can know the true joys of human love only if love for God first rules our hearts. It's only when He's in His rightful place in our hearts that people can then be in the appropriate place in our lives. You see people all the time not get this right. There's been times in my life when I didn't get it right. If love for God isn't first and foremost in your life, then your need for human relationships will be too great. And you will be asking people to do for you what only God, your Savior, can do for you. You are looking to find your identity and deepest sense of well-being in the acceptance and the love of other people. And I have to tell you, that will never work. You know why? Because there are no perfect people in your life. In some way, all the people around you will fail you. In some way, every relationship in your life will disappoint, me and disappoint you. In some way, and at some point, you will be sinned against. You will be hurt. And no mere human being is qualified to be your personal Messiah. You see, if, if God is not in His rightful place in my heart, in my life, guess who I insert in that place? The answer, of course, is me. I make my relationships all about me. Rather than love for God shaping my relationships and motivating me to say and do the things I do, love of myself becomes my driving force. And because then that God is not at the center of my thoughts and desires, I expect to get from people in my life what only God can deliver. And this always leads to disappointment and even hostility in my relationships. So I pray harder and I work harder to make those relationships what they will never be. In fact, what they can never be. There's a children's book about a land called Serendipity, or a children's story. And in the land of Serendipity, everybody goes around and gives and collects warm fuzzies. And that you take the warm fuzzies and you stuff them inside of you and you feel so good, it feels great. 
But the writer of the story tells us people can also give you a cold prickly. And a cold prickly can mess up a whole batch of warm fuzzies. You know how that works in your life? Here's what the gospel is. God fills you up with warm fuzzies. And you can still get hurt. People can still give you cold prickly. But as long as your source is God, those warm fuzzies never go away. And you don't have to try to go get warm fuzzies from other people to make yourself feel good. Because you know who loves you beyond anything else. So much of what we call love, if we're honest and we look at our hearts, is not really love. It's like doing a song and dance routine, trying to get somebody else to love me. God is the only one who can help us love unselfishly. Because we're not looking to people then to be God for us, to give us things only God can give us. We know who we are, and out of that, we can love others. Only people who love God will ever be able to love their neighbor as much as they love themselves. It is only when God is in His rightful place in my heart that others will be in the appropriate place in my life. So, when a human relationship in my life is not exhibiting love, it merely reveals a deeper problem. That I have not loved God as I should and have not experienced His love for me as I should. I make it all about me. And therefore, I don't love that other person the way that I should. And that truth also works in the other direction. My lack of love for God is revealed by the lack of active love I have in my relationships. John says it this way in the sermon passage for this morning. We read the verse earlier. Here's what John told us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. See, Pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty pointed. Love for others really begins, continues, and is daily motivated by love for God. It really is true. Our relationships need more than horizontal fixing. They need vertical rescue. And that's why Jesus put first things first. Love God supremely. Because that's the only way you can love your neighbor as yourself. And if we love our neighbors as ourselves, then the second thing we need to talk about is love cost us something. According to Jesus' words, how much are we to love others? Notice what He said. We're to love others as much as we love ourselves. See, love isn't just a a sentimental feeling or a deep emotion. It's purposeful. It's intentional. And it's active. How do we know that? Well, love you love your neighbors, you love yourself. Let me ask you something. When you're hungry, what do you do? You feed yourself. You get something to eat. When you're thirsty, you get yourself something to drink. When you're sick, you take medicine or you go see a doctor. Why do you and I do those things? Because we are all consumed, whether we realize it or not, with taking care of ourselves. We do whatever it takes to provide for ourselves and our personal needs. Well, Jesus says that's the type of love we're supposed to have for other people. To care for their needs. To show genuine interest in who they are as a person. James summarized that really well in his letter when he said this, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is death. 
So just wishing people well is not enough. We can certainly use our words to express our love for God through prayer, through singing, just like we did this morning. We can spend time with God through devotionals or Bible reading or trying to listen for His voice. But how do you perform an act of service for God without serving another person? How do you give a gift to God without giving it to or for another human being? How do you physically touch God without touching people? You can't. But when we serve, touch, and give gifts to other people, we are nonetheless doing it for God. Just like Jesus said. You remember the passage in Matthew 25. He said, I tell you the truth. Anything you did or do for the least of my people here, whether it's feeding them, giving them something to drink, clothing them, visiting them when they're sick, when you do that for them, Jesus said, you also did it for me. Loving our neighbor is second in importance only to loving God because loving people is really, the way Jesus talks about it, just an extension of loving God in our life. Jesus couldn't have given us the greatest command without also giving us the second greatest command because the two are completely entwined. Loving people is the visible manifestation of loving God. If we extend love, real love, to another person, it will cost us, both physically and emotionally. If you see a need, and you feel a nudge by the Holy Spirit, then with God's help, meet that need. Don't try to unload the responsibility that you see on somebody else. Do not think that just alerting other people to a need fulfills your obligation. If you, if you see a need, you meet that need. Now you may not have the physical resources, but you must also guard your heart, and I have to guard my heart, against hoarding what we have. It's so true. Some physical needs may be bigger than what I can take care of by myself. Then I reach out to others, tell them what I've seen, and engage their help. That's how we help people physically. Listen to the Holy Spirit and obey what He's saying. But emotional needs in our society are just as rampant, if not more so, than physical needs. And all of us can help others in this area. I mean, we're living in a world where people are hungry for attention just to know that somebody actually cares about them. George Varna, the poster, did a poll in a study that concluded that while America is the wealthiest nation in the world, her population is also the loneliest in the world. And the more people get into social media, I mean, it's, I think it's great what social, the gifts social media gives, but the more we get into social media, we may feel connected, but we're, we're isolated. Many people are, who have those accounts, they're still lonely inside. And you can minister to people emotionally by reaching out to them and connecting with them. I mean, think about it. There might be somebody, think about somebody in your, in your mind, in your heart. Uh, somebody you know who's been down lately. Call them this week. Tell them that you've missed the, seeing them and that you'd like to invite them to dinner or, or to your home for a visit. Write an encouraging letter or a note to somebody. I have to tell you, People love to receive something in their mailbox that isn't a bill or junk mail. If it's personal. I mean, that, people don't take the time to do that anymore. It's valuable to do that. Loving God means loving people. And loving people means going out of our way, rearranging our schedules, or using our resources to meet the needs of people around us. When you put your arms around Someone who needs a shoulder to cry on. You are fulfilling the greatest commandment. When you give a gift to somebody struggling to pay their rent, 
or somebody who doesn't have quite enough money to pay their bill in the grocery line, grocery line. You are loving your neighbor and your God. Reach out to people physically. Reach out to people emotionally. But most importantly for us, reach out to people spiritually. If someone is in distress or great need, I have to tell you, they almost always will respond positively to somebody who merely says, can I pray with you? Sometimes that's hard for us to, to do that and jump out of that and, 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 and try that. But I, I guarantee 90% of the people you ask that to will say yes. And notice I didn't say pray for you. Many times we'll tell people, I'll pray for you. And then we forget to even pray for them. A lot of times. Or if we do, we're just praying for them. I said pray with them. Because it's so powerful and meaningful to hear another person call out to God in your behalf. To say your name out loud to God and ask Him for comfort and strength and help. You know what the Bible says is the mark of a Christian? Is it our views on abortion? Or homosexuality? Is it our involvement in a Bible-believing church? Is it our doctrinal stance on salvation? No. And I'm not saying any of those things are unimportant. They are important. But what causes us to stand out from the world is not our convictions, as important as those may be. It's love. When we can live a life of love, the world takes notice. Jesus clearly stated His heart's desire, His deepest desire for us, His followers, His people. He said, all people will know you are My followers if you love one another. So all of this sort of begs the question, how loving are you? You know, the Bible offers us a little test. It describes what perfect love looks like. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 13. We call it the love chapter. Listen to what he says about love. Think about your life. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Love will last forever. That's what love is. And against that standard... Let's be honest, none of us really measure up. When it comes to the two most important commands God has ever given, not one person has ever kept them fully in all of history. That is, except for the one who gave them. Jesus is the only one of us who ever lived the commands to love God and love people to the fullest. In fact, something amazing happens when you replace the word love with the name of Jesus in that same passage. Listen to this. Think about it. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Jesus does not demand His own way. Jesus isn't irritable and He keeps no record of being wrong. Jesus does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Jesus never gives up. Jesus never loses faith. Jesus is always hopeful. And Jesus endures through every circumstance. Jesus never fails. You and I may surely fail. But He never will. And neither will an expression of His kind of love.
Now, you and I, we can't live that type of love perfectly and completely. But we can live it authentically, admitting when we fall short. And that's the life you and I are called to live as followers of the most loving person who ever lived. Love God. Love others. Just like Jesus did. Let's pray. Father, I think almost all, if not all, the people in this room, including me, want to learn how to love better. Want to love the way You love. And we find ourselves failing so often. So help us realize we we can never do this in our own strength. We can't grit our teeth and decide we're going to love everybody today. It's not going to work that way, Father. It's because we have love for You and we know how much You love us. And by the power and presence of Your Holy Spirit in our lives, we can act in ways that go against our nature, go against our flesh, go against our selfish way of looking at life. But we have to know that truth. We have to love, experience that truth and realize that truth in our hearts and our lives. We'll never do it perfectly, but I feel pretty certain, Lord, all of us can do it better if we just learn to look to You and see You as our source of love and the source through which Your Spirit can flow through us to love those around us. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.